<laughs> Hello, can anybody hear me out there? Is anybody going to watch this? Hello. <laughs> Let's see if I can see myself. Do, 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 do. Okay, by the looks of it, I can hear, uh, hear myself talking. Hello, this is a live stream uh, of um, me talking about um, microscopy at home. So I wanted to show people a few, uh, a few little things. Um, maybe I'll wait for a few people to get into the chat. I've got one person watching at the moment, lovely. So what I wanted to do with this stream essentially was to um, show people how you can set up a home microscope and um, show you some of the things that you can look at using a home microscope with a pretty cheap and effective setup and um, sort of maybe try and inspire people to try and do it themselves because whilst we're theoretically locked down under, under COVID-19 uh, it can be fun to do some uh, do some interesting learning at home and this is a really good example of one of the things that you can do so I've got the everything set up hopefully it's working okay um, it would be great if I can hear anyone in the comments to check the audio is okay I'm here I've recruited my 10 10 yo too thanks thanks Amelia um, can you hear me all right otherwise there's not much point in me just saying stuff is there So there's probably a little bit of a lag between uh, when I talk and when you receive the uh, the audio from it, I would think. Do, 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 do. Yes. Okay. Good. Super. So I've set up this stream so it can it can show a couple of different things. Obviously, if, um, we've got me uh, talking in, in the top right hand of the screen. On the top left, you can see my live microscope feed. Uh, which I'll which I'll go into in a little bit, and that's where I'm going to show you some different things that we can look at under the microscope. And um, the bottom left, you can see a, a little slide that says, at the moment, random objects. What I'm looking at. So maybe we'll do a little bit of guesswork at the beginning. I'm going to put some objects under the microscope uh, for you to try and guess what they are, and then some other. Um, those will be inanimate objects. And then we'll also move on to some living organisms as well and talk about them as we go along. And then if people have got questions or comments or things that they want to talk about in the chat, then um, then we'll go for it that way. So good. So let me just show you the setup. So if you're interested in doing a bit of home microscopy, if you go on eBay or you um, go on, dare I even say it, Amazon, but maybe don't give Amazon your money because they're parasites. Um, <laughs> you can purchase a, a, a USB microscope. So if you just Google USB microscope, you'll often come up with things like this. And it's a very, very simple device. It plugs into any PC. It's essentially quite plug and play, um, given the right software. Some of them come with their own little disk and their own little software. Others you have to download or install it from, from elsewhere. And I'll show you the software I'm using in a minute. But essentially you plug it in. It has a, a wire with, I don't know, let's see if I can pull this in front with a little light um, adjuster on it usually. And you can see there's a little ring, if I just show that to the camera, a little ring of LED lights. So these LED lights, I can adjust the brightness on just to blind you all like that. Um, and, and usually there's like a, they come with a little cover as well, just to, just to keep the dust and the dirt out, which I'm gonna remove for now, cause I'm gonna be using it. So these can be picked up really, really, really cheaply for as cheap as eight nine quid um to up to 30 40 pounds um and they're supposedly i mean some of these things are very strange some of them on the front will say between this one says between 50 and a thousand times magnification which i know for a fact is nonsense so um this is more like a 50 times magnification low power microscope that you might get in a lab um and they come with different kinds of stands most of them look like this and you can actually pop off the little 
um, the microscope itself and move it around, which is, can be quite useful because you can point at things. I can probably point at my keyboard here, for example. Ooh, it's hard to keep it still in this situation, but you can you can see I'm looking at the keyboard. Um, and most of them will come with a at least a little clamp stand like this one. This is the cheapest version, is, is the ones with the clamp stands. But some of them come with a nice stand that you can manoeuvre up and down that's much more stable and you can adjust the height on. And if you've got the money to do that, they're worth picking up. They're really, really, um, really effective. They work really well. So, yeah, so that, that's the microscope. And what we've got um, is I've set it up. So the reason you can see this screen over here um, is that I've got it running through a separate piece of software uh, called ImageJ. Now, ImageJ, hopefully, if I just share my screen for a minute, uh, let me have a look. Boop. Hopefully, you'll be able to see my browser. Not that you want to see that bit. Um, and on the browser, um, I'm just bringing up so so in case anyone else wants to do this, what you can see is ImageJ. Now, ImageJ is a, f a free piece of software, uh, very easy to download. It's a tiny, tiny piece of software. Um, the the, uh, the link is up here, and you simply go to the download, download the, f uh, the file for your relevant uh, operating system and then install it and there's all, all documentation to help you use all that stuff. Now ImageJ is a really flexible bit of software. I'll show you a very small number of the features as we go through um, but there are so many different features that you can use with it if you really really fancy digging yourself in deep. But in order to get it set up for one of these USB microphones you have to um, also fiddle around a little bit more and install um, an additional plugin so over here, uh, here's, here's the, the link for this from, from uh, the NIH. This is a webcam capture uh, plugin for ImageJ, which allows it to not just um, look at images, but to capture live feeds from any, any kind of camera, actually. So we can run it um, to just to capture a webcam if we wanted to. And in this case, it's essentially treating this microscope as if it was a webcam and, and getting a getting a live feed from it, pardon me. Um, and it's a bit fiddly, but you can find the description here about how to install it. And if anyone's got any questions about it, I can, I'm quite happy to help people out and point people in the right direction of how to install it. So um, that's essentially um, what I've got set up and what I've got running. Um, and that's what's allowing me to, to have these two separate um, screens going on here. Just looking at the chat, um, hello people who are watching, Joe, uh, Amelia, um, my dad, Steve, hello. <clears throat> um, trying to convince me my, t trying to convince my 10 year old um, we need one of these and the software. Well, Amelia, I reckon I can convince you. So uh, let's start um, looking at things. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna set these things up. It probably uh, will require me doing a little bit of fiddling and you'll see that because this is not on an, an ideal stand, because it's on a kind of wobbly little stand, you'll get a little bit of movement and I have to be quite careful, but it's still very doable. So in the chat, I'd be really interested to know what people think of this. What do you think we're looking at here? Maybe I can scan around a little bit across the surface. It's an inanimate object. To me, it looks a bit like a belly button. What do people think? What am I looking at? I can give you a clue in a minute if you were, uh, if you're puzzled. Amelia, maybe your son knows. I should sing to have an intermission, shouldn't I? A ball with pointy bits. No, that's a very good guess. It's smaller than a ball. Any other guesses? We've got a few people watching now. I'll give you an audio hint. What do you think it is? Dan, Dan, you said you need a clue. Here's your clue. Any ideas? Megan's joined us. Hello, Megan. 
We all need a clue. I, I've given you a clue, an audio clue. Maybe there's a bit of latency. Did you hear that rustling noise? I'll move, I'll move the microscope around a little bit more again. Maybe I can turn the light up. Maybe I can show you this bit. Clue, yeah, still waiting for a clue. Vicky's just joined us in the chat. Have you got any idea what we're looking at at the moment under the microscope? Amelia's son says plastic. No. Well, the, the sound that you heard might have been plastic, and that's linked to the thing we're looking at. Ah. Packet of crisps. Okay, fantastic. I'll show you what we're looking at. It was a mini cheddar. Uh, and I'm not even sponsored by them. Yeah, mini cheddar. Well done. So, mm. Now it's just going to be a video of me eating. Okay. Next unknown object. It's quite hard to get a focus on this one. You can actually um, get in a little bit closer sometimes. You can see there's a bit of a wobble. I think this one's a bit easier. I think you can guess this one. So what do we think, folks? What, what's this one? What are we looking at? Are you meant to eat your research? Mm, I don't see a problem with it. I'm quite a food-orientated person. Yeah, I think there's like a... a I, I think the chat takes about 15 seconds or so to catch up. Um, so I can I can always sing in between if people fancy that. Some crystals or rocks? What a fantastic um, guess! you I guess you're right with the first one, Daniel. Can you narrow it down? Can anyone narrow down crystals? I think you're you're right. It is crystals. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Well done. Sugar or salt? Yeah, this is sugar. It's. Uh, does anyone want to be really fancy and talk about whether it's granulated or caster? What do you reckon? <laughs> so that's a good one. I'll move on to the next one whilst you're trying to guess that. So just a few random objects to start with. I'll move on to the next one. There you go. There's the next one. What do you think we've got here? Shout out if you need a clue. I'm going to carry on eating my mini cheddars. Sugar crystals, yep. <laughs> yeah, if this video is mainly me eating mini cheddars, then... That's science, I guess. So what do you think we have down here? Oh. Dan in the chat says, granulated. No, you had a 50-50 chance and you spoilt it. It is, in fact, very high-grade caster sugar for, for baking. A clue, please. Wow, you couldn't be further out with this one. Uh, maybe I can move it around. It's quite hard to see. It's, I mean, it's on my table, so uh, let's see if I can... Maybe the maybe the shape of the end of the object helps. I can sort of pan across the whole thing as well uh, if I get it in the right direction, like so. Weird colour for a fork, yeah. It's definitely not a fork. It's much smaller than a fork. Hello, Alex. Nice to see you in the chat. We're just guessing uh, what random objects are under the microscope at the moment. So if you have any idea what the things you're looking at are, uh, let me know. Sweet, says Amelia. No, it's not a sweet. But you're closer, I guess. This one's, I think this one's difficult. I think this is a tricky one. I'm not sure what was more difficult, whether the, the generic cheddar-like crisps, I probably shouldn't advertise them. 
Um, I don't know if that's more difficult to identify than what we're looking at now. Fork, no. Yes, it is edible. Yep. Eraser. Yeah, good guess. I guess it does look a bit like an eraser, doesn't it? Like a rubber. No, it's not that. It's, it is edible, though. Oh, you've had clues, Amelia. You've had clues. I'm li loving the mystery element of this. This is uh, this is enjoyable for me. Anyone? Any more guesses? Shall I tell you? It's a. It's a grain of rice. Maybe someone's about to guess that in the chat. Uh, so yeah, grain of rice. Uh, and I'm going to show you and talk about how we can measure objects uh, to quite a, a good level of uh, accuracy later as well using ImageJ software. So we'll, we'll get onto that. Uh, ox tongue. No, it's not ox tongue. Uh, yeah, okay, good. So one more random object and then we're going to move on to living things and we'll talk about living things. So uh, let me start with this one. Yes, that was a grain of rice, Amelia. Yep. <laughs> Hello to everyone watching. Looks like we've got about five people watching. That's nice. So you can see you can have a lot of fun with this. I think it's a really good, um, good tool for for kids. If you've got kids, um, to entertain uh, during during your time uh, over the summer that can be uh, can be a really good tool for that but I think it's a good um, good tool for all of us you know even even scientists we, we can use these things for quite useful purposes a pen no not a pen a Nintendo switch stylus uh, Alex knows me a little bit well uh, it's not a Nintendo switch stylus it's much smaller than that um, more points to uh, Steve Berman. I don't know who that guy is. I mean, he's got a funny name. Um, yes, it is a sewing needle. Let me show you the other end of it, and that'll become quite clear, I think. Uh, let me see if I can just get that in shot. Oopsie. Let me have a look. Oop. The difficult thing is, let me see if I can show you the eye. Oop. There we go. So there's the eye of the eye of the needle. Thank you, Dan. You enjoy your meeting as well. Have fun. So, those are the the weird random objects, right? So that's where we started with. But they can this sort of thing can be used really effectively to look at uh, living things. So earlier on, I posted um, a very short video, sort of a preview video of this living thing, and just asked if people could guess what it is. So moving on now, we are now on to living things. And if I just focus in nicely, I reckon my dad knows this, so I reckon he should he should be quiet. Um, I've got to go to the bank. Yeah, have a good day. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for dropping in. You can watch the rest of the stream later anyway, so if people do need to drop in and out, that's absolutely cool. Um, yeah, so what's this one? It's... Um, it's got a nice colour to it. It's alive, so you, everything from now on is going to be a living thing. So you've got clues there, and like I said, my dad is in is watching, and he does not get to comment. But I reckon a few other people might be able to get get this one and guess it. I had some good guesses uh, in the preview video earlier on. Any ideas? <laughs> I can move this around a little bit as well so we can see some different regions. Quite beautiful, I think, this one. You can see that you have to adjust the focus quite a lot. Flower of some sort. No, that's a good guess, Amelia. It's not a flower. It's quite flower-like. So there's the sort of edge. And you can see you have to move quite gently when you're when you're um, adjusting these sort of hand handheld stands. 
Uh, Palmer Ham. We're, yeah, we're, no, it's not Palmer Ham. Um, I think that's a bit of a joke, Dad, because you know I'm a vegetarian and have been for a while. Uh, I'm a chemist, living things are not my field of expertise, but you did say mushroom. Well done, congratulations, Amelia. Uh, if, I, if, if we look to the bottom left, so I can reveal uh, on the bottom left there, that's, that is a mushroom. It's a pink oyster mushroom. So what you can see here is the underside, the, the lamellae, the gill structures. So you, you'll all be familiar with these things. Uh, with a mushroom, these gill structures contain um, some of the spores, the sexual spores that are produced by the mushroom called um, the, the basidiospores. And this structure, the structure that we call a mushroom, you know, this, this fruiting body that you can see in that picture, I can just show you it now in, in reality, it's just a bit of one. Uh, this, this structure is called uh, a basidiocarp. So this, is, this basidiocarp underneath has these lovely little lamellae. And actually, if I, if I zoom around a little bit, there is a kind of whiter seg section that appears a little bit more fluffy in some regions. Um, and that's where some of the spores have already been released. So sometimes you start to see these little strings underneath these things. Uh, which which are strings of these little spores. So well done, Amelia. That is a mushroom, <coughs> obviously a fungus. And this is um, a species called um, Pleurotus jarmor, or sometimes there's we talk about varieties with mushrooms a lot because species are quite hard to pin down from a taxonomic point of view. Um, so uh, you'll also hear um, Pleurotus salmonistraeus, but it's a pink oyster mushroom. Uh, tropical native to sort of um, Asia, essentially, uh, and, and grown commercially for food. So there you go. So that's number one. So moving on to the next specimen. I reckon people will be able to guess some of this. Okay, so there's the next specimen. I'm trying not to block out too much of the light. I've got a bit of natural sunlight on this as well. So what do we think this specimen is? I think it's probably an easier guess, this one. Let me try and adjust the light a little bit. I want some top-down light. The other thing is we can also, you can also try, and these things say they're up to a thousand times magnification, which is bit of nonsense but they do go a little bit closer in if you tweak and fiddle them so I'll try that a little bit and you might be able to see a little bit more closely this is very very close in actually this is a really nice shot so you can you can get quite high magnification with these things if you play with it your son says some sort of leaf. Yes, it is. It is a leaf surface. Can you guess what kind of plant, uh, what kind of leaf surface it is? Um, the nettle leaf is a, is a good guess. Um, I'm guessing that it, it's not right, but uh, I'm guessing the reason you're saying nettle leaf is because of these hairs on the surface of the leaf. So for those of you who don't know much about plant biology, these little hairs are called trichomes. And trichomes serve a lot of different purposes on the surface of the leaf so one of the one of the things that they uh, serve to do is to produce chemicals um, and if you can just make out in this image here there are a kind of tiny little globules so you can see probably one two three globules on some of these trichomes and most of these globules are secreted uh, compounds often um, compounds which are meant to uh, prevent fungal growth so pathogenic fungi that try to grow on the surface of the plant will be inhibited or, or killed by these uh, or in some cases they're uh, what we call antiphagants so phagant phagy is to do with eating anti is is against so against eating it's an it's it's a chemical which stops insects eating the the, the leaf the plant um, this is more fun than a than a normal microscope. No, I don't think so. I think this is pretty this is pretty standard stuff. Uh, don't push me, Joe. Leaf is as good as it's going to get from me. Herbie leaf. No, and I don't think we're going to get any advances on that. 
this is a really well protected plant it's a tomato plant and tomato plants produce these lovely aromatic smells if you've ever ever been into a, a, you know a greenhouse full of tomato plants you get a very very pungent smell due to things like hexanals being given off some of these um, sort of short carbon chained molecules and um, and a lot of these things are are there as defense so that it's kind of cool to look at the surface of a leaf because you can see these lovely little structures they serve other purposes as well so one of the things that hairs do on a leaf surface is they stop water loss so the um, underneath the 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 well, sorry on the leaf surface there are these tiny little holes called stomata these little pores which allow water to move in, in and out uh, and uh, under circumstances uh, under some some circumstances they have to keep them open quite a lot uh, but that can lead to a lot of water loss and one way you can minimize water loss is actually by creating a little turbulent airflow at the leaf surface that means that the the, the linear air doesn't just pull away all the humidity in 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 a few seconds and actually these hairs can assist to doing that by creating these little micro whirls these little whirlpools of air so they're, they're they serve a mechanical purpose and a chemical purpose and even um they will even provide a, a protective layer to stop insects from being able to get through them you imagine trying to wade your way through kind of a a sea of these hairs when you're a tiny little aphid or a white fly it would be really really difficult so yeah, that's a tomato. So I can reveal that on the bottom left. Uh, next, I'm gonna. I'm gonna take a subsample of what I've got here. Uh, let's zoom out a little bit. Let's try and get a really nice shot for you all. Oops. And Amelia, uh, I'm going to test your biological knowledge again. It's quite difficult to get this one in shot, actually. Oh, difficult. Difficult, difficult. It's because it keeps... I keep dropping it. Hang on. <laughs> Quite difficult to get a good one here. Let's try and have a look at some of these. <laughs> I think my specimen's a bit poor. It's always good to have a good quality biological sample, but the living things never play play the game, even when they're not moving around very much. Right, let's get this in focus. Pretty, I think. It's at least pretty, even if you don't know what it is. I'm also very impressed with your Facebook Live since last week. Oh, thanks, Amelia. That's kind. Well, we're just experimenting with it. I think it's I think it's a fun sort of um, format to uh, to experiment with. I think it's you know it's a nice nice way to engage with people about stuff like this, and and hopefully people will. Uh, if people like them we'll do some more of them um different in different formats and um uh yeah we'll see how popular it is and, and people can always watch this stuff back as well so it could be quite interesting any idea what this one is i reckon we're going to stump you with this one so this one is buddlia Buddleia davidii, uh, more more specifically, and here here you can see the whole flower. Yes, it is a flower, and it is a purple one. Do you know what? I'm not sure if it's edible. That's a good question. I suppose I could I could try, but.
but this is uh, more commonly known as a butterfly bush so you've probably all seen these guys in your garden a really sweet nectar and a very very strong aromatic smell and a combination of the color the um, chemicals given off by those and the scents given off by those flowers um, and the nectar make them a really really good source um, source a, a really really good way to attract butterflies in your garden uh, and I was trying to get some butterflies off mine earlier on but they were flying away so yeah brilliant uh, and you can see the flower so uh, hopefully you can see kind of there's a purple rim to it and what I was hoping to do was look right down into the middle of the flower but I just haven't got quite the right specimen uh, you were close with lavender not quite there um, and the inside the yellow part you can usually see the female parts so the the stigma uh, where but below the stigma this kind of um, bulgy bit in the middle of the flower you'll find the ovary so the female parts of the flower in the middle and the male parts surrounding that which are, uh, are called the stamen so we'll we'll see if I can see those um, maybe in a in another setting a bit later um, well okay my dad already asked about oh Oh, we've got a surprise visitor. Okay, we've got um, something else which will, which I can show you that's just popped out of the Buddleia. That's nice. Uh, whoop! Hello. All right, stop, 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 stop. Stop, stop moving. Typical little bugger. <laughs> okay, I think this one's probably going to be a bit too mobile for me to. <laughs> Keep hold of. Are oh, you stopping there? Little bugger. So we've got some small, I think we've got some small chrysomelid beetles uh, and a few other things emerging from this buddleia. Maybe I'll have a little look later on. Uh, anyway, good. So, yes, uh, I did. We've, we've got some lavender, and you can actually have a little look. Lavender is a wonderfully aromatic plant, again, um, and it produces some really interesting volatiles. Um, particularly phenols for the chemists uh, for Amelia uh, on the surface of their of their leaves and, and also to some extent in their flowers and a lot of these um, these compounds these chemicals are antimicrobial so there there is quite a lot of work done into the essential oils of things like lavender uh, as one of these aromatic sort of herby plants um, and you can just see inside the lavender oops hello this is lavender, lavendula. You can see these yellow structures, and that's where we'll see the pollen, hopefully. Not sure how closely we're going to be able to make that out. Oops. Yeah. Oops, I'm moving it all over the place. My apologies. So yeah, this is this is a lavender. And you can see some of these nice trichomes all over the surface of this as well. And of course, once you've got a flower and the flower's been pollinated, um, the the male bits, the pollen, um, essentially land on the stigma, this kind of bulgy bit in the middle of the flower, and they grow and they form this thing called a pollen tube, which is an amazing thing. It's it's literally a tube structure that digs its way down into the the female parts of the um, of the flower uh, and fertilizes the so the the, um, the nucleus of the pollen grain ends up going into to join and fuse uh, with the egg the the ovum of the of the female parts of the flower and that causes it to fertilize and pr produce an, um, uh, an embryo and an embryo will eventually form a seed and seeds are often found in these things. So what are we looking at here? You get brownie points for this one. We know it's a fruit. Maybe this bits. You can see there are different colors here. Maybe the colors will give you a little bit more of a sense. This is not necessarily the, the ripest of fruits. Beautiful colour though. So yeah, this is this is a fertilised, if you like, a fertilised flower. 
Um, the, the, this could have been self-pollinated. In a lot of cases, um, flowers will self-pollinate. So that means the male from one individual self-pollinates its own female parts, if you like. That happens quite commonly. Um, and also, in some cases, um, you get crossing. So um, pollen will come from uh, another flower to um, the male parts of the uh, of one flower and will be transferred onto the female parts of another flower. And then you get slight mixing and genetic diversity caused by that. So, um, and that's really important in maintaining the health of a plant population. But that they pollinate in lots of different ways, of course. That pollen can be carried by the wind. It can be carried by animals, particularly uh, insects. Birds are quite good pollinators, even small mammals. Uh, bats can be pollinators. Um, and really what's wonderful about that, right, is that essentially flowers and fruit, um, a lot of people think, oh, yeah, all right, flowers and fruit. Flowers are pretty things that you give your spouse, you know, um, on Valentine's Day, and fruit is what you eat from your fridge. But if you think about it from an evolutionary point of view, flowers and fruit are there to manipulate the animal kingdom. They've evolved for millions and millions of years in order to incentivize animals, um, particularly animals, to pollinate. So many flowers um, take on the, the shape and the smell and the form of female insects, for example. Uh, things like bee orchids um, appear and, and smell like a bee in order to attract a male bee. Um, and in doing so, they manipulate the animals to do all the real hard work for them. Uh, if you're a plant, you can't go wandering around carrying your pollen from, from one place to another place, but you can rely on something to carry it for you. So a lot of them are very clever about manipulating uh, animals, and that includes us. You know, the reason we think fruits are delicious and, we, and we're happy to, to, to be going around eating fruits all of the time is because the plant made it that way it the, the plants have evolved to um to manipulate their structure and their taste and their flavor and their appearance so that they're um, attractive and edible to us and once we eat those those fruits we carry the seeds to the places where the seeds need to go to and we dis dispose of them and i'll leave that down to your imagination we dispose of them wherever wherever they need to go um yeah, so tomatoes. Okay, we're trying to guess this one. Nicole, that's a good guess, tomatoes. It's not tomatoes. Um, uh, Amelia just can't, you just can't deal with it. That's fair enough. Uh, potato or solanum fruit. No, that's a, a good guess. Uh, no, this is in fact a very young blackberry. So you can just about see this one. Uh, so it's Rubus fruticosis common these are all common things that you can find all over the uk so you'll, you'll know brambles really well one of the fastest growing plants in the in the uk can grow several centimeters every day produces these um these lovely fruits that end up very very bright and colorful very tasty and what's nice is that you'll see them at different stages so I, if i look at my bramble outside at the moment some of the fruits are at this stage sort of greeny slightly reddened stage some of them are pretty ripe um, and others are, are still flowers and they spread the production of their fruit over time and it's thought to be quite an intentional evolutionary adaptation because if you produced all your fruits in one go um, some of them would get uh, eaten by birds and moved around as they should be but a lot of them would just drop and decay and rot in into the undergrowth whereas by pr producing a steady stream at different sort of staggered points over the season brambles can make use of all of the animal vectors through the whole whole summer period so that's why you tend to see these different ripening stages uh, on your bramble beautiful plant fascinating plant it's, it's really responsive to mechanical stimulation as well a bramble believe it or not if you're walking down a country road and you brush up against a bramble um, and then you the next year you come back to that same patch of bramble you'll find that it's grown more thorns down that side, the, the side where you stimulated it, in order to defend itself. So whenever there, there's a, a persistent threat, a mechanical threat, they produce more defences in order to, to protect themselves. It's a really interesting plant. Um, right, now moving on to some other organisms. Moving away from plants a little bit now. Oopsie. So, what do we have here? 
I'm sure people can get this from a broad point of view. Even Amelia will get this one, I'm sure, as our resident chemist. She knows more biology than she's letting on. Uh, and while you're guessing, I'm going to go back to my generic cheese snacks. Although these are not just cheese ones, these are nacho cheese and jalapeno. So, I will carry on with that. Mm. Are brambles the same as blackberries? Yes. Uh, I guess the blackberries are the are the fruit, um, and the bramble is the plant, but ostensibly they're the same thing. Yes, Nicole, it's an ant. Absolutely, it's an ant. So ants are members of a larger taxonomic group called the Hymenoptera, uh, and the Hymenoptera really are, are the most intelligent of all the insects. So you can see it's an insect. It has six legs. You can hopefully make out the three pairs of legs. Um, and these ones have some really lovely mandibles. So this one here, you can really see uh, at the top there, it's kind of biting mouth parts, but it also has some kind of sucking, absorbing mouth parts in the middle as well. And then they have these very, very thin little antennae and often um, quite well defended. So a lot of these things will secrete acids from their ab abdominal areas. Um, if, if a couple of my students are watching, you've probably seen me eating ants um, uh, wood ants in the forest. This is not a wood ant though, this is a common black ant. So this is a, um, a species that you'll find much more commonly in your garden. I think sometimes it's called the common garden ant. Um, a little tip for you guys. Um, one of the things that I find really useful when you're trying to observe uh, moving things, things that are going to likely wriggle around quite a lot, um, is uh, particularly with invertebrates, invertebrates are what we call poikilotherms. Now, poikilotherm just means, um, uh, I suppose that the, the the basic way of saying it is cold-blooded. We often talk about cold-blooded animals versus warm-blooded animals. Um, technically, that's it's a bit of a misnomer. But what poikilothermic means is that um, the the animal does not regulate its temperature. So the temperature broadly corresponds with the environmental temperature. E.g., if an ant gets cold, its metabolism slows right down because of the temperature. If an ant get ant gets warm, its metabolism and indeed its activity will um, speed up accordingly. And that's different from what we call homeothermic animals. So we are homeothermic because we regulate our body temperature. Even when it's cold outside, we have mechanisms in our bodies which will keep our core temperature up up in the the mid to high thirties. Um, in terms of Celsius. So you can use that to your advantage with invertebrates because you can cool them down if they're becoming too active. And what one of the things that I have here is a little um, a bowl of cold water. It was cold water and ice, but it's now mel melted, but it's still very cold. And you can put your Petri dish or your container inside that little bit of cold ice just to cool them down. Uh, it won't kill them, it'll just um, slow them down as long as you only do it for a period of a few minutes and that can make them much easier to visualize so these ants have chilled quite literally been chilled out so yeah hymenoptera quite beautiful little things moving on so i've got, I've got <clears throat> a few more to to show you and then we'll uh, we'll wrap up at some point i'm hoping this guy's going to play play Ooh. oh okay Play the game. So, what do we have here? I reckon this is an easy one. So you're a vegetarian slash vegan but eat ants. Well, look, they've got a slightly different nervous system from vertebrates and we don't farm them in... Uh, very damaging and intensive situations that lead to poor animal health conditions, poor environmental health, and um, uh, and potentially zoonotic diseases breaking out. So yes, I'm I'm more happy to eat ants than I would be fluffy animals. So you'll notice, uh, in, in case you don't know what this is, yes, you're you're close there, Amelia. Um, 
slug, yeah, you're very close. I think you'll probably guess that it's not a slug if I do this. So, uh, it's not a slug, it's a snail, of course. And this is your common garden snail. So, I get annoyed with this one because the taxonomic name of this has changed quite a few times over the years. Um, it used to be Helix Aspersum or Helix Aspersa, but it's now Cornu Aspersum, and I always get that wrong and get them confused. But anyway, it is indeed a uh, snail, a, it's really running away from me now, um, a common garden snail, and these are hermaphroditic mollusks. So this is what we call a pulmonate gastropod, uh, gastropod uh, meaning mouth foot so these things have what's called a radula a mouth part underneath their muscular foot this this whole structure that they use to move around you can see this one's zooming around now um maybe i should just put him maybe you just see the uh, macro version and uh underneath so right underneath this this muscular foot here they've got this little radula which is a rasping tooth-like structure um uh, and these things are mostly made from calcium. So this whole whole shell is made from uh, calcium. And all the little lines that you can see, the little striations and stripes, are the layers of calcium that, that this snail's built up over the years. And, and pretty much all gastropods, all slugs and snails, um, are herbivorous. There are some very, very limited examples that aren't. Um, Notably, the um, oops, sorry. Notably, the cone snail, which is actually a poisonous, no, venomous snail. Uh, how have you noticed how much you are talking about sex on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, biologists are interested in sex. That's kind of one of the driving forces behind biological diversity, right? So there you go. Um, okay, so this guy, I'm gonna. Uh, we move. Most of those specimens that I've just showed are things that you could commonly find in your garden. So fun things that you can play with with your kids, or if you wanted to just just uh, educate yourself about what you've got in your garden, you can see these microscopes would be a really good way of doing that. Um, this, however, is something that you will not find in your garden unless you live in Brazil. So let's have a look. I'm going to try and it's quite quite large actually. So I'm going to try and get a good shot of this one, or at least part of it. Yeah, this could be a difficult one for you to guess. Maybe maybe the best thing for you to. Do, 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 do. Yeah, that's probably not the best shot. I might actually give this one a very gentle prod. Very gentle. Spider of some sort, excellent. Fantastic, well done Amelia. We will make a biologist out of you yet. Quite hard to get a good shot of this guy. Let me turn the light down a bit. It is a spider. There are lots of different groups of spiders. Um, and in Brazil, this is one of the more prevalent groups. Hairy beast. Yes, it is a hairy beast. I'll just have a little look down there. Yep, let's, let's actually reorient this a little bit. I've got, I'm sure this will please people, but I've got a little bit of um, snail uh, mucus on my finger now. So that's, that's delightful. Now look at these lovely little pink legs. Aren't they pretty? I hope for your sake it is a very small spider. This one is relatively small. I would say it's about 
15 millimeters, something like that, maybe a little bit more. Anyone hazard a guess what type of spider are we looking at? Or what group of spiders, I suppose? I'm not, maybe you won't be able to get the species. The carapace is a bit of a dead giveaway. This kind of um, rounded structure that they have, you can just about make out the eyes. If you look to the right of the image between those two pink legs, one at the top and one at the bottom, you'll see a little shiny object and that's that's the eyes. No one guessing. Da, da, da. So this is a species of tarantula, um, a Brazilian species. So. You get two groups of tarantulas. The, 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 the collective group is the Therophosidae. And uh, Therophosid spiders or tarantulas are these kind of hairy, hairy tarantulas, um, which range from, well, you find them in lots of different places across the world, but you have uh, old world and new world tarantulas. So uh, old world tarantulas being um, tarantulas found in Asia, Africa, those parts of the world. Um, and then the New World species found in predominantly South and Central America. So Mexico down to, to, to um, places like Brazil, where, the, where this species is from. So this is Coquiana brunipes. It's um, actually a dwarf species of tarantula. They only grow to maybe a couple of inches in length, um, whereas a lot of tarantulas will grow to about five or six inches on average, and some bigger than that, 10, 11 inches in some cases. So yes, it is a tarantula. And what I'll try to do is see if this will take a feed in a minute, um, because this one hasn't been fed. In fact, I could do that now, couldn't I? Let me have a look. Let's have a look. So I've got some crickets, which are going to be the food item. These things are carnivorous. They tend to sit in a small burrow and wait for food to come to them, which I think is what this spider will do. And I'm hoping, she's just fairly recently molted. You can see she's got quite, I say she, I don't know if she's a she yet. Um, she's got some quite nice fresh colors to her. Uh, and I'm hoping she may take this cricket. You may see some very instant movement in a second. So keep your eyes peeled. I'm building up tension now, but probably nothing will happen then. But let's see. No, she's not interested. She's literally running away from it. Now she is webbing. She's going to show off her abdomen a little bit. So you can see those two little structures that are sticking out there are spinnerets these are these are silk glands essentially that they use to to spin web from so you see these kind of little hooky structures i don't think this one is interested in the cricket i'll i'll leave it there and we'll see what she does in a minute um okay and one of the last specimens i had again not from uh the uk is this little guy I don't know if it's a guy or a girl. It's, it's unsexed at the moment. Okay, let's have a look. Again, not from the UK. This animal comes from, actually, all, all, all across the world. So you'll find these in, um, you'll find them in some parts of the Mediterranean, in Northern Africa. It's having a right move around now. Um, in some cases, you'll find them in Asia for this species, but in, in general, they're found all across the world. Beautiful structures that you can see there. This this one's cleaning itself, so you can see it's cleaning its uh, legs at the moment. So it's, it's using its mandibles to work its way up the tarsi, the, the little uh, leg structures with the little claws that you'll see at the end there. So does anyone want to hazard a guess at what the sort of common name for this thing is? Helps if you can see its head, actually. So I can probably just... Oopsie. Hello. Oops. 
very delicate to move these things around to get them where you want them. Ah, you bugger. <laughs> It is a mantis, yeah, it is a mantis, fantastic, well done Amelia. Um, so uh, Blepharopsis mendica, it's, it's got loads of common names, um, I think the most common one is the uh, lesser devil's flower mantis, so it's, it's, got, um, it's got kind of patterns and camouflage that allow it to hide pretty well in its host, um, well not host plants, in, in the plants that it lives in. It doesn't eat the plants, it only eats uh, small invertebrates. So I will try and see if this guy will eat something. Um, he's really having a good old move around now. And let's see if he's interested, or well, he or she is interested in a cricket. These guys are usually quite effective feeders, so it wouldn't surprise me at all if this guy goes for it. Let's have a look. And they've got very good... Here we go, he's, he's spotted something going on. Um, <laughs> very good vision. Very, very large eyes. Uh, 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 hello. No, not interested. Oh, no. Oh. Uh, and this could be quite gruesome if it does take it. Yes, here, here we go. Right. So, excellent. So, uh, let me just try and get you in view. It's very difficult. So, what you can now hopefully just about make out, that's the head of the mantis. On your right-hand side is a struggling cricket, this little black thing. And... Um, Generally speaking, they're very clever. They, they, their mandibles, they, they orient the insect in such a way that it can't attack them. And they tend to eat the soft bits first and, and leave the head till last uh, under most circumstances. So yes, this is very violent, Amelia. You're right. Sex and violence. <laughs> I think it's kind of cool to see under a microscope, though. A bit hard to make out all the individual parts, but you can see it munching away there it's going to have a it's tucking into it like it's a baguette or something at this point um so i feel sorry for this cricket to some extent but that's that's life i guess um okay and i think that's kind of all i wanted to show you in terms of specimens um i'd, I'd like to just show one more little thing which is how we can use this software so um let me just move our little mantis friend out of the way and I'll show you a technique which can be used to to measure things because science is all about accuracy and measurement. Now I'm probably just going to go back to my screen now. I'm going to bring back the eye of the needle and one of the things we can do is we can use our software in order to uh, measure the width of the eye of a needle. Okay, And this is a really useful technique if you if you want to be able to measure anything that's very tiny this is kind of what you're looking to do. Now what I've got um, next to this needle, I've got my object in focus, but I'm also going to bring in this, which you will probably recognize as a ruler. You can see there, these are the grade marks on the ruler. So each one of these marks uh, is represents one millimeter. So that's about five millimeters you have in shot there at the moment. Now if I bring my, uh, let me bring my capture back up again for uh, for the software, oops. Hopefully you can see my screen okay. And um, one of the things you can do is you can take take pictures. So if I go into my um, my image J software, it has this little um, um, window. It has this little section here where where you've got a pull down menu. Um, can you see this all right? I'm just hoping it's, I've shared it okay. I'm looking at my own screen in the uh, in the stream. I'm trying to see if it's there. Da -da 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 -da. Um, and essentially, what you can do is is calibrate the the image to this size. So 
Uh, is it showing you it? Mm -mm. Let's have a look. Right, you can't see what I'm seeing at the moment, can you? Two secs. Uh, window capture. Okay, <clears throat> temporary, temporary glitch there. Um, I'll just show you this last last few bits, and and then we'll we'll finish the screen, um, uh, the stream. So uh, one of the things we can do is, hopefully, uh, display capture. That's what we want to do, do, do. Okay, so hopefully you can see my display. Um, now it'll look like infinity. But let let me bring up this uh, this display here. Um, and what what we can do is we can uh, we can process this these images. So if I go to edit and copy, and then I go to file and uh, new, and then internal clipboard, and I click on that, it will um, give me the copied image. So this is the image of my ruler. Now what's nice about this is once I've got an image, I can click on these different shape tools that you see on the left including this linear one here and I can define an area or a shape or a, um, any kind of uh, object. Now what I'm going to do is just define a millimeter by drawing a line from one side of this millimeter mark to the other so from the th from this leading edge here to this leading edge and uh, what you can do with this software is you can measure things very effectively using the measure function so if I go to analyze and measure it will measure uh, all sorts of categories and, and characteristics of your your sample of your image. Now at this point, it's it's giving me a length of that line as 108. Now at the moment, this means 108 pixels, which is not very useful for us. Uh, we want to know a little bit more about uh, how big it is in real terms, but we know how big this is. We know this is one millimeter. So uh, what we can do on top of this, like if I just close that window for a second is if we go to um, oops if we go to analyze and go to set scale if you set the scale you can see it's it's selected that number of pixels in my little box so that 108 is already pre-selected here for my line and we know that that is one and we know it is one millimeter so what that's basically doing is converting any images that are used in this same uh, same focal length to say well for every millimeter you will have 108 pixels and that will allow us to um, to measure other things so I'm going to click global that just makes makes it apply to all images in your sample set I'm going to press OK and then what I'm going to do is take a picture of something else so let's get rid of that for a sec and I'm going to bring back my pin head and I'm just going to try and flatten it out a little bit oop, oop, oop. It's a bit difficult very fiddly you have to have careful hands and I have no careful hands whatsoever let's give that a go ah okay that'll do so as you can see, and I can take another image of this, or if I want to, I can just use the live image. So again, I'm going to use my little line tool, and I'm going to draw a line from this side to this side, and I'm going to measure the size and the width of the eye of a needle. Now, I've already calibrated the number of pixels um, per millimeter, so all I need to go to, to is analyze and measure, and you can hopefully see that it now says that this is 0 0.57 millimeters in width. So we, we are measuring within quite a high degree of accuracy here, um, slightly over half a millimeter. And that's, that's it. So you could measure the size of an ant. You could measure the size of um, anything really that you can get an image of using a webcam or one of these, um, one of these smaller cameras. Uh, 
So I hope that's been interesting. I hope that's been useful. Sorry for the slight drop in the stream and some of the technical issues, but I'm trying to work out how these things uh, work. I hope that was fun. Uh, post in the comments if you've got any suggestions for other things like this, if you found it useful. Um, and uh, if not, I will. I think I'm going to go and enjoy the rest of Friday, and I wish you all a really nice Friday. So thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>